Hi, I'm John Mark Young, President and Chief Investment Officer of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers. And I'd like to welcome you to another installment of the Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers, What We Learned in the Markets This Week video. Remember, our aim is to provide you, our valued clients, with a brief video giving you information that is helpful to your understanding of the markets from a biblical worldview with no financial agenda, which of course makes us uniquely different from the news media in America. This video is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon to make investment decisions. The clients of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers may maintain positions in the securities discussed in today's videos. And all opinions discussed are solely those of John Mark Young and not those of Whitaker Myers Wealth Managers. So let's talk about the four things we learned in the markets this week, starting with point number one. Point number one was it seems kind of fitting. The Major League Baseball season is now over and... Terry Tito Francona has hung up his managerial cleats after an incredibly successful career that included stints with the Cleveland Indians, most recently, of course, and the Boston Red Sox. Of course, with the Boston Red Sox, he broke the curse of the Bambino and won them a World Series, nearly did the same for the Tribe, and they just kind of lost a seventh inning, or, or excuse me, game seven extra inning defeat to the Cubs to break their uh, historic drought of championships. They, Tito was on the wrong side of that. And in very much the same way that Francona broke the Red Sox curse, perhaps his retirement this week has broken the markets, at least the S&P 500's four-week losing curse. Because we actually saw a positive result this week, although that looked in doubt Friday morning when the incredible jobs numbers were released and the market responded terribly dropping about 200 points. So maybe that's a stretch pushing all that together, but congrats, Tito. But before we get into the jobs report in point number two, and I'm going to talk about that in point number two, let's dive into some of the parts of the market that we found interesting this week. And part of it was on Tuesday of this week, we received the JOLTS report on job openings in labor turnover. This report wrecked the markets for the day. It had a terrible day. It pushed down the major averages all deeply, deeply negative over 1% for the day. The number the market didn't like was job openings number. And that showed that we jumped back up, reversing our downward trend. And now we have 9.6 million open jobs. That's 690,000 more open jobs than we saw last month. Now, why would this make the market drop? Well, it's going to make the market drop because it's all about inflation and interest rates. If our labor market is too strong, it's going to force the Fed to continue to raise interest rates even higher than we currently sit putting more downward pressure on stocks in the stock market at large. However, just like in Friday's job report, there was some good news embedded in the report, and that was the quits rate, the rate of people quitting their job, presumably for higher pay. The amount of workers who left their positions, which is a good measure of how many people are leaving jobs for again, higher pay, and higher pay puts pressure on inflation. That fell back to pre-pandemic levels, or at least very close, as you can see on your screen. So that was the good news of the JOLTS report. Each week, we also look at the Fed's GDP Now model. This model takes real-time economic data and gives us an estimate of where GDP will land for the quarter. At this point in the quarter, and we're still looking at the third quarter 2023 data, it's a pretty boring time to look at this. There's not a lot of data to be released or no more data to be released actually for the third quarter. And the actual number and the Atlanta Fed's number are a very, are a very tight correlation. Um, nothing to see here because it held steady at 4.9% for the third quarter. And again, that's just as we talked about last week, still 2% above economists' predictions. Now, when is the GDP number actually going to come out? It's going to come out on October 26th at 8.30 a.m. by the Bureau of Economic Analysis. So we've got a few weeks to see how this number actually plays out. But I can bet you I'm going to be watching that very tightly with a bowl of popcorn. Actually, it's 8.30 in the morning, so just coffee in hand. As we spoke about the labor markets earlier, each week we look at the initial claims for unemployment insurance for a proxy for potential signs for the labor market and how it might be turning the corner in a bad way. Well, not happening this week. Again, this week the number came in at 207,000 initial claims for unemployment insurance staying within its range and at historically low numbers still. And then finally, of course, we look at the stock market each week and how they correspond to our Dave Ramsey categories. Those numbers are this, the S&P 500, which is a proxy for our growth and growth in income, but only when taken together. That was positive 0.48% for the week. Again, breaking the curse of the Bambino, four-week curse of the S for the S&P. The Russell 2000 attracts smaller and mid-sized companies or aggressive growth in our Dave Ramsey vernacular. That did not break the curse. It was negative 2.12% for the week. Not a great week at all for small caps. 
And the MSCI IFA, which tracks international stocks, that was negative 0.58% for the week. So the S&P 500 was the only index positive for the week. Point number two, as discussed above, on Friday of this week, we received the U.S. non-farm payroll number, which showed an increase of jobs created in the U.S. of 336,000. And they revised the previous two months numbers, July and August, by 119,000 to the upside. The markets, when receiving these numbers, immediately sold off because they were expecting to only see 170,000 jobs created. Again, this is good news, but it became bad news for the markets and investors because they're terrified of what these strong numbers might mean to the Federal Reserve and what they might be forced to do because of them. Now, thanks to CNBC for making this nice chart you can see on your screen. Here, you see the bulk of the jobs were created in the leisure and hospitality sector. That's something that we've continued to see all year and continuing its strong post-COVID-19 return. The worst performer was the information sector, mainly because of the job losses we've seen because of the motion picture strikes that just ended. So those presumably might, might take a peek uh, to the positive side. And speaking of labor disputes and strikes, we haven't seen the effects of Kaiser Permanente, and that's going to affect the healthcare sector. Uh, which was the third highest grower this month, and the auto manufacturers, which as you can see the manufacturing screen was middle of the pack with 17,000 net new jobs created in the month. Then about 10.50 a.m. on Friday morning, the markets bottomed and they started a rebound for the day, creating a 2% swing from down one to up one. Now, why was this? Well, there was actually signs we're seeing the labor market slow down despite the hot top line jobs number. And that was average hourly earnings were actually coming down. They only came in at plus 0.2%, 20 basis points. If you take that 0.2% increase we saw last month and the 0.4% increase we saw, uh, in you, which was the previous month, and you average those two together, you're coming in at a 3.3% annualized, annualized rate for wage growth. Now, you might be asking, the Fed wants a 2% inflation, so wage growth around 3.3 is too high, right? Actually, no, not necessarily. Wage growth is a little different. Here, what you want to see is you want to see the 2% inflation number in wage growth plus another 1.5% for productivity growth. This means if people in technology can make things more productive, if we can produce more productively, we can be paid more and growth is still happening within the economy. So with the numbers averaging to 3.3% on an annualized number with the last two months only, what we see is if these numbers persist, if we can keep numbers in these ranges, then wage growth is looking just right. And that's what the markets were able to digest, sending the averages higher and positive for the day. Thank the Lord. End of the week pretty good. Point number three. One thing from somebody that's pessimistic, I would expect them to say is this. These higher rates are going to break something in the market. And that will immediately, with a lot of speed, cause our U.S. recession break something. Well, if something does break, it will most likely occur within the banking and financial sector like we saw earlier in the year when we kind of had a regional banking crisis because of what we saw with SVB, First Republic, and Signature Bank in New York. And had that crisis stayed around or expedited further, it could have caused a lot of pain. Now, as you can see on your screen, the KBE, which is an index that tracks the banking sector, and the KRE, which is an index that tracks only regional banks, both of those have tumbled pretty significantly this year, down 19 and 30% respectively, while the S&P 500 sits at a 12% year-to-date return. One thing that can trick an investor is when a stock falls like this, there's usually a reason. And again, certainly the SVB, First Republic, Signature Bank issues still sits out there as a issue that potentially could crop itself back up, all those uh, held to maturity uh, loan or uh, bonds that the banks have. But earnings growth within the banking sector has not been strong. And now with a dividend yield of 1.6 on the S&P 500, you can almost guarantee a dividend cut is coming for the banking sector. Why would I say that? Well, look at the dividend yields that you're seeing in the banking sector right now. It's three times what the S&P 500 is with some banks like the Key Bank being the best at 8.1% dividend yield and the lowest being Zions Bank at 5%. And thanks for data Trek for this information. Uh, that means that unless the bank earnings take a surprise turn to the upside, we will see a large cut in these dividend yields in the coming months. And at this point, a reduction in earnings 
probably is going to be an unwelcome surprise for these banks because Wall Street right now expects the banks, every bank on this list except for Comerica, to post earnings in line with 2023 levels. Basically, stay flat. Comerica's expect, Comerica is expected to see an 18% decline. So if you're pretty bullish on what might happen in the banking sector, you might want to get into something like KeyBank right now because it's paying an 8% yield. But common sense says we're going to see a quickly drying commercial loan market affect bank earnings. And that's going to take bank earnings lower, not keep them the same, but lower. So don't get sucked into a three times higher dividend yield because there's usually a reason for it. And we would say right now, all you're priming yourself is for dividend cuts in the banking sector. And finally, point number four, ah, uh, bad decisions, bad decisions. Each week we look at the Investment Company Institute and they give us a report that's called the fund flows for mutual funds and ETF reports. What you hope to see here is that when the market pulls back, you find investors buying low and putting money into funds, flowing money into the funds. However, that's rarely seen, unfortunately. Rather, what you see is when the market gets bad, you'll see a large amount of money run for the exits from these funds, selling low. Unfortunately, last week, after the worst month of the year, people were net sellers. Now, net sellers, maybe that's not such a bad thing. Well, not just some run of the rip mill net selling. It was a weekly rate of 18.9 billion, which is the largest for the entire year and the largest since December of 2020 and September and October of 2022, excuse me, December of 2022, when we were hitting the worst of last year. When we hit that similar level last year, it marked the buying time as the market has made a tremendous run this year. However, people were net sellers. And again, they were net sellers last week in a big way. Now, why do I bring this data up? Well, when I checked it, as I do every week, the number just jumped out to me because it was so large, $19 billion basically after a huge run down. And that was after the week before we saw net five or $9 billion flow out of funds, out of funds. If you haven't learned this by now, you may just not be made for the market, which is okay, I guess, but you're not going to be able to pick up the better than average returns over a long period of time because you can't time this stuff up. It's impossible. As we see here, the average of people is doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. They're selling low. The only thing I would say at this point is when people are running for the exits as they are, we've definitely seen that the last two weeks, 9 billion and 19 billion. It's probably more a sign it's time to buy just as it was last year. Because last year, as I told you, the time when we had runs out of the market like this was October of 2022 and December of 2022. Those were arguably the buying opportunities last year. And if you got in then, when we actually were more people, significantly more people were getting out, you would have had a solid, solid return through that period of time. Better than the 12% we've seen this year, because you would have picked up the, the good part of last year as well, too. So that's why our, we say, again, it, you can't time this stuff. Please don't try to. These videos are informational only to help you understand what's going on, not to make buying decisions. You know how you make buying decisions? You make buying decisions in terms of the stock market with your time horizon in mind. Not to make a quick buck, but your time horizon should drive your investment decisions. When I'm saving for retirement, and retirement is 10, 20, 30 years away, that kind of time horizon argues for stocks for the long run. Be diversified, use the four categories like Dave teaches you, use good strategies, make, make investment sense, make sense, but don't try to time the market. Don't try to get yourself out because it gets a little rough. Because guess what? Life is rough. Sin entered the world through one man. And through sin, now we have all kinds of problems. One of those problems is a stock market that doesn't go up in a straight line. So you've got to be okay with that. That's why we put these videos again so you can understand what's going on. It's not that the market moves without rational rationale. It moves with a lot of rationale, but sometimes not maybe. But but most of the time it does, and that's why we do these videos to help educate you so that you don't make bad decisions on selling because you just don't know what's going on. So hopefully this video was helpful. If it was, would you do us a favor? You can do us a favor by hitting the like button. The like button on YouTube helps us with their algorithm. Their algorithm says if you watch this video and you don't hit like, maybe the content wasn't as great as we would expect it to be. And so thus, we're not going to push this video out to more people. But when you do hit like, and a large majority of you like that helps us and we appreciate that so much as well as you can hit the subscribe button 
subscribe button helps us so that you can get the content we create out as quickly as possible, including these videos, our question of the week video. And in November, we're going to be doing a economic Q&A video with one of the top economists at a large investment company. You're going to be joining me to do some Q&A to talk about the markets. We'll be pushing that out through our videos here, uh, our, our YouTube channel as well. So thanks so much for watching today's video. If we can help you with anything, go to the comment section of this video and you can click on the link to schedule a meeting with our financial coaches who help you in baby steps one, two, and three, get out of debt, stay out of debt, live debt free and create a budget. Or maybe they'll just help you save on the cost of college, not for college, because our financial planners can help you save for retirement, for college, for create a plan to pay off your house early so that you can eventually get to baby step seven where you can live and give like no one else. Thanks so much. We'll look forward to seeing you next week.